Uh, welcome back. Uh, as we've been hearing throughout the morning, uh, there's a tremendous concern, and one of the key concerns about RTB is where the inventory is going to come from. Uh, almost all of the, uh, the RTB engines that I talk to, almost all the case studies that I do around this, uh, this amount of innovation, uh, VCs have been dumping capital in this space for a long time, but unfortunately, sometimes innovation and efficiency are inversely proportional to each other. And I think another thing that's going on that we're seeing is that most of the investment has been on the remnant side, the unsold side, the indirect side, less on what is 80% of the inventory. And I think that's one of the things we're trying to address today because that innovation has proven to be very valuable. Uh, programmatic buying, for instance, uh, which today is mostly about indirect, is promising as it can bring efficiencies to the marketplace, which I think we can all agree uh, there's probably about 10 or 12 billion dollars of waste in our space today that needs to be fixed. So the question we're going to try to get into today is how do we take, uh, can we take what is programmatic buying today and the efficiency that goes along with it and get it moved over out of what is effectively just ad network inventory today into what is referred to as premium. Uh, so I'd like to give you guys about a minute, minute and a half to introduce yourself uh, and also focus on where you sit in the, uh, in the ecosystem so we know where the fights are going to begin. I'm going to start in the end, or do I get to go? Skip, you can go first. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, uh, Media Post and Joe, for having me. My name is Skip Brand. Uh, I run a company called Martini Media. We focus on the 50 million Americans and the 50 million Europeans who make the most, and where we find them, those are 100K plus, where we find them is on their passions and their professions. So we represent 1,000 publishers. These 1,000 publishers are small but beautiful. So they can be Reed Elsevier, and we just focus in on American Journal of Medicine. By the way, $300 CPMs if you're endemic on those sites. We get to bring up and uh, represent the non-endemic ads, or like a LexisNexis for lawyers. So we have about 90% reach to those folks who make the most and actually now spend the most. And where they spend is online. Most important, they also socially fly the most or set up uh, what we call influence. But the reason I'm here is we built the company based on automation, based on innovation. And we think the most automation and innovation uh, is in the premium, uh, whether it's, you called it remnant. So we think there's more higher margins there. It's more desirable by context, by behaviors, as well as uh, other areas. So I'm very, very fortunate uh, to have uh, some great premium uh, publishing partners that I'd never expect to be able to work with. Uh, and all I need to do, and I love these guys, out innovate Conde in sort of the lifestyle space and out innovate Wall Street Journal a little bit uh, in the B2B space. And the best way to do that is with you all in innovation. So thanks for having me. Hi, Mario Diaz, CEO of Quadrant One, and uh, we are a joint venture owned and operated by uh, the news industry. And really our part in the ecosystem is we are an aggregator of the most premium local news um, and, and television broadcast stations. And our goal here in the industry is really to bring best in breed technology so that we can enable efficient and smarter connections between the marketers and the local publishers. So for us, it's about taking any type of national message and heat mapping up any of the really difficult local positions across the country because it's very difficult to do. So what we do is we provide a very flexible platform that enables through ad technology um, and that's about the conversation at hand. So Jay Seidemann, uh, director of the U.S. Um, targeting and exchange team at Microsoft Advertising. Um, Microsoft, obviously, we represent the, the sell side, um, which is unique to the panel that we just heard from. We, we do get involved in a couple different areas um, on the sell side, and we operate a media network. We also operate an advertising exchange um, through our partnership with AppNexus. And so that brings up a lot of challenges for, for any premium publisher who wants to do both those. We also have a, a very premium brand business. So, so it's, a, it's a pretty delicate balancing act. And I think we've got a lot of, a lot of best practices um, to share um, around our learnings and around how we can make that work. I think we were joking the last panel was, was from the buy side and, and sounded a little bit like RTB should stand for race to the bottom. We, we don't think that um, operating and participating in the RTB market uh, necessarily means that we're gonna lose out on revenue or necessarily means that we're only gonna capture um, 
bought the, the, the lowest common denominator. So we, we need to figure out a way to, to make money uh, multiple channels and offer our advertisers who want to access us on a brand or buy our media network or buy our impressions in the exchange. We want, we want to offer that choice, uh, but we need to maximize yield at the same time. So. Uh, Vikram Samaya, I run audience analytics operations and uh, um, uh, non-direct monetization for Thomson Reuters. Uh, Reuters is the largest news agency in the world. We generate about um, 89,000 stories a week, about 530 stories an hour, so there's a lot of news pumping out there. Um, we also have a $15 billion financial data division, so we have a lot of interesting data that we're beginning to harvest now and pull into our media business. Um, the first thing I'm actually going to take issue with right away, Mike, is a little bit around semantics, right? Real-time buying, uh, programmatic buying, you keep hearing this stuff. As a premium publisher, it really, really pisses me off, right? Clearly, we're not talking about real-time business. So, Publishers have been justifiably, I think, a little reticent about moving too quickly on into a space where, frankly, you know, we're not known for being super nimble. Um, so we have to tread carefully, and I think we are. Uh, but we're making the right moves, I think, to figure out what's going to happen in the next year. Uh, but I'm sure we can talk more about that as we get into it. Uh, Adrian Thompson, I'm the VP of BizDev with, with DataZoo, and I believe the, the only uh, representative of the, uh, the buy side here on this, this, uh, this panel. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yep, should be, uh, should be, should be fun. Um, Hopefully you have Ranger tickets. <laughs> um, so I, I guess a couple things I would, I would throw out uh, up front is obviously uh, programmatic. I mean, we're, we're huge believers in programmatic and not just programmatic limited to, to remnant or exchange traded media. Uh, but programmatic across the entire buy. I'm sure we can talk about that as we define programmatic. Um, and also another, I guess, somewhat of a perhaps misconception is that that we don't, um, from the data zoo perspective, we we obviously trade every day on the exchanges, um, and we buy a ton of of exchange traded media. Um, but but it's not that we have any specific love for for the exchange traded media that we're buying. Um, but but rather that was the first opportunity to apply. Um, an impression level decisioning technology um, so that we can actually evaluate each uh, individual uh, impression and, and drive the performance or, or brand performance for, for our advertisers. So I guess what I'm most excited about is, is actually uh, to see this programmatic construct and see the operational efficiencies um, actually move in sort of the greater buckets of spend uh, that are being generated by, by some of the premium publishers here on the panel. Um, Vikram, I think you bring up a great point. I think that's one of the goals of the panel today is to get to what does this look like uh, from a publisher's point of view. If the RTB space was built to actually help media companies, not just the buy side, uh, what would that look like? And Because I think that's the only thing that's going to really free up premium inventory. And we'll, and we'll get to that a little bit more, but I, I, I want to start with something you guys have brought up. Um, programmatic buying is a word that's kind of used for lots of different things. Uh, some people think programmatic buying means RTB. Sometimes people say it means it's indirectly sold. It's about automation. Um, Mario, what, what do you, how do you define programmatic buying? What's the essence of it? Well, I, I, think, um, I think there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace around what programmatic buying is. I think the premium publisher set launched into the RTB landscape because we heard from the premium buying agencies that this is how we were going to transact. Now, five or six years ago, there was a universal language of data, right? The media buyer would be able to log into a comm score or another, another firm like that and say, I have a really high index of 156. I call a buyer, and there's a universal trust there. Well, right now, what's happening is that that's completely, it, it's, it's being demolished right now. All the data is really residing on the buying side, right? So, and that presents a lot of difficulties for a publisher to interact because I know, you know, I don't necessarily know what DataZoo is buying for their clients. I know what they're bidding and so forth. So it presents a lot of challenges with the how to write business. So for us, programmatic buying um, is, there's a lot of advantages to it with respect to how the efficiencies work. But in terms of how it interacts in, with, the, uh, with the premium set, it, we're still very much in the, in the first inning there. So, so and I, I think this is something that's talked a lot about. Obviously, an auction usually works best when there's equal information on both sides. Uh, that's clearly not the case in our space. Uh, Adrian, why aren't you sharing the data with the buy side? Uh, so, I, good question. I mean, I, I think that, that uh, well, I mean, first of all, I mean, the, the, the sell side has never really had that information, right? I mean, it's, it's always been largely in the hands of, you know, DFA and on the buy side. 
Um, and uh, I think from, from our perspective, we, we, uh, the, the performance data or brand data that we see from publishers is actually not, not data Zeus to share. It's owned by our advertisers. Um, and it's, it's up to them if they want to share that data with, with publishers. Um, but what we are seeing a lot of success with is, is especially sort of more of a, a blended approach where we, you know, some of the, the uh, exchanges that we're buying on and publishers are seeing their reports and seeing what we're buying and getting more transparency than they had before into what we're bidding, how much we're paying, and then actually approaching us directly. Um, and then we are actually doing more of a blended approach where we'll be buying um, you know, inventory more directly from the publisher uh, as well as via the exchange. And we've seen some pretty good success uh, with, with that construct. But Mike, uh, just when you don't have information in the system, for example, with premium publishers that we get to represent, what's so fun is if you know the brand lift of, let's say, a site, tennis.com, is going to be 20% for Amex over what they normally buy of some other more reach play publishers, or you know the GRP score is going to be higher, or you know the, that uh, possibly the cost per is going to be higher, if that type of information, which would be like real-time case studies, then you would actually be talking about what publishers like, which is what's the highest CPM, what inventory sold out. So we'd actually be helping out the system by really you know, showing more of the metrics. We have an initiative called Making Basically Measurement Matter. It really should be Making Measurement Make Money. Because if the measurement was there for the publishing side uh, better, it would better represent the media. Therefore, what we don't have to do tonight for the Ranger game, which will be all the premium publishers taking big brands out for, I don't know, tickets will be 1500 bucks. But that is your performance measure, which is not easily to be automated at the Ranger game. So the idea is we bring our stats out and help buyers understand that it's a good buy for certain things. We'll help ourselves quite a bit. And with Microsoft in the middle, they could do this instantly. So, they want to. so, so in the end, you know, I think we're trying to we're trying to solve with why publishers don't want to do this, and uh, this is not a minor issue. Publishers have uh, almost a palpable anger about the idea of doing RTB. Well, We've seen a lot of panels out there where there have been lots of major fights over this. I, I'd love to get from you guys. Why do you think publishers, agencies like it? We've seen that in the other panels. Panels. Why do publishers dislike it? Well, uh, I mean. Obviously, for a premium publisher, they, you know, historically they've built their audiences themselves and they've tried to create scarcity around their inventory. And this is just a different way to value their inventory. And it's not based on their own data. It's not based on their own context. It's primarily today RTB is based on audience. And so that's very scary for a publisher um, who doesn't have the controls, who doesn't have the, the, the ability to manage their marketplace. I think going back to the asymmetry of, of information um, ask or what it means for for publishers to to act in this space um, you know we're, we're we're trying to manage a holistic marketplace so we have you know we're, we're sort of adapting to the model we know that programmatic buying is going to happen with or without Microsoft so we said we want to participate but we also said we need to set some rules around how we participate so on the direct channel you might get some visibility in, into inventory you might get guaranteed inventory on the indirect channel or the RTB channel, there might be different settings. There might, you know, we, we need to make sure that we clear inventory at a certain price. And that really rubs, uh, rubs the buy side the wrong way at certain times. And we understand that there's certain things we need to do to, to adapt to that. But we also know that, you know, we want to be open to the different ways that buyers want to access our inventory. And if we wanted to maximize one over the other, we could do that. But that's not that in a premium publisher world, that's not what exists today. Our primary revenue source is still the direct side. So we have to make decisions on the RTB side that limit what, what uh, buyer's visibility into how they consume our inventory. And so what I'll say is, you know, two, three years ago, a lot of those tools didn't exist. And through our partnership with AppNexus, through some of the technology that we built, we actually can manage that marketplace effectively. Uh, so, so you guys have taken control I think the sell side the has, is, the is catching up, yeah. I think Vikram is certainly someone I know that's been trying hard to get control. Well, uh, so, so I think historically what happened is when they came to us and said, we want to, you know, we're not going to give you our metrics, but we want access to your inventory, you know, the publishers went into their secret back room and said, well, fuck you! We're not going to give you access to our primary, to our best inventory, right? But, by, but, by, but by the way, we, nice these guys have the a way. side bet on, on whoever drops the F-bomb the most gets a buck from everybody else. 
<laughs> that's that's <laughs> one zero 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 zero. What happens actually, yes, in Fight two. Club should stay in Flight Club, Mike. <laughs> But, but I think it speaks to a more fundamental problem premium publishers have, certainly, which is, you know, Joanna's talked about this before. There is a bifurcation coming in terms of us wanting to sell high custom, high value creative units. I mean, the banner has to change. It has to evolve, especially for, for creative experiences, because our real enemy is not the buy side. Our real enemy is old traditional media that has lean back properties like TV. And that money is not coming our way. I keep hearing about declining trends in TV. They're having year over year best years. We need to create better experiences. So if we're really talking about RTB being just about remnant, well, who the fuck gives a shit, right? I mean, it's tiny money for us. So we have the, the, the big direct bucket. We have a huge set of, of budgets that we should be going after with better creative. What we need is standards so we can then create a programmatic foundation around selling that to the buy side efficiently, like TV sells today. So, so the, the thing I keep hearing, I mean, people talk about what the definition of premium is. The definition of premium, to me, is, is it a good price? If, am I getting paid the value of the impression? And that's not... Well, isn't it performance? Who gives a shit about price well, if well, it performs? I mean, from, from we're in a market, I mean, just so you get it, we're so in a market where 1% and a click-through rate is awesome. That skip, means 99% it doesn't skip, work. Skip, uh, performance is in the eyes of the beholder. From a publisher, performance is price. Right. Right? That's or how, sell, that's, the business that they are, that's the business that they are in. But one publisher so, might think so, $3 is a premium price, yeah, and another all, one all, might think all, it's 17 all, all I'm saying is that the thing that there, I think that there are two things I've heard that are holding publishers back from giving their inventory into this. One is, do I get paid enough for it? Second, Am I resolving the channel conflict issue that comes out of this? Well, you, you brought up a great point about how everything is on the remnant side right now. And if, if you're going to jump into RTB as a premium publisher, you got to take a look in the mirror and say, if you're going to put your shitty inventory in, that's one for me, if you're going to put your shitty inventory in... Shit doesn't count. <laughs> if you're going to put your shitty inventory in, you're going to expect shitty rates, right? If you're going to put your below the fold, bottom of the barrel stuff, it, it works on both sides. Premium demand will come through a marketplace when there's premium product. Right now, premium product is too customizable, and we have tens of thousands of salespeople out there that hold the buyer's hands for that. It takes you know, a lot of resources to chase down creative resources and so forth. So until we have standards for the premium side, that's when it should get easier. And you know, when we talked the other day, Mike, you know, RTB could get really interesting when it becomes a program. Imagine what Yahoo's homepage would go for if it was put out to auction for Black Friday. So maybe it's not an impression, maybe it's a program. Maybe it's a, a block of audience. So, so, do, so do you guys agree that the reason that the prices are low is because it's not good inventory? Is that, is that the only thing that's affecting the price? I think there's, well, there's, that, that's probably one of the things that affects the price, but I think the other one is, is a vast majority of the spend that's running on the exchanges is performance driven. It's measured on view through conversions. And frankly, if your view through comes from Microsoft or comes from a, a, you know, a reach publisher, a long tail publisher, you get the same credit. So, so, so if you're bidding against a, a view through sort of mechanism and, and you're trying to be the last cookie in, which is how a lot of the DR buys are done, then, then you will pay a, you'll pay a low price because you don't value the fact that you're, there's a more premium audience or there's a more premium context. You value the fact that you can get that impression at a good price and get credit from the advertiser. But you want innovation to solve problems. So you brought up a great point. If you're looking for, let's say you're a brand and you're looking for rising star units, the most portrait you can get, uh, we have about $30 million worth of it. I thought everybody would have a lot more of it. So the only par comparable, and I wish it was Microsoft, it's AOL who has a lot of it. That isn't available on the exchange, and it does go unsold. So another way to get more value from premium publishers is to take some of your more interesting formats that are hard to scale and bring it out to places where brands like auto brands, travel brands, and others need that scale in rich media. So you can actually, you know, the systems can handle that. We just need to put our inventory in it. Again, I think we're, we're dancing around one topic here in that, you know, yes, there's low price um, demand out there that we can capture on NRTB. But publishers have controls to block some of that low price, whether it's on an advertiser by advertiser basis um, through a creative compliance policy or whether it's through price point setting price floors. And I think, you know, it's not like, yes, there's a lot of DR 
budget out there in, in the exchange world. We don't capture a ton of that. We capture a lot of audience business, and we're seeing more and more of it. Some of that's direct response, but it's not bottom of the barrel. It's not low CPM uh, demand that we're seeing from it. So again, I think the sell side is catching up with these tools, and I think um, you're going to see more, more of that learning going into the, the, the premium seller's uh, strategy. So I, I agree completely on the audience side. We, we've grown our audience business in nine months from zero to 25% of our revenue because it just made a lot of sense. Much like Skip, we have a very premium, high-income, global business traveler audience, so it's very easy to find good, interesting ways to monetize it. But I think in terms of being able to take that and then being frustrated about not being able to use it in a programmatic fashion has led us to build what our private exchange looks like, very similar to the way Jay is advocating, which is you look at who's bidding, you look why they're bidding, are you, are you wondering why somebody who sh should never be doing it is bidding $75 because they're obviously a cookie bomber, exclude them, right? From a premium perspective, it's pretty easy for us to look at the 5,000 odd bidders coming in and say, we only want to work with these 120 because we know that they're not scum suckers, right? So it's not, there's not that much intelligence that goes into it. It just takes work. I, I think one of the things that we see out there and it, with our clients is, you know, when, when I talk to agencies and I talk to, uh, to DSPs, um, what they're saying is that they are buying this inventory, the audience inventory, at, at, at good prices. And that may be the case. Uh, but what on average we see, and we've checked this data with a few other sources, including Forrester, is that on average we're seeing four to five dollars is what's being things are being bought for publishers are getting a buck there's a lot of stuff going on in the middle so it doesn't matter whether someone valued a premium if you didn't get paid premium um, now I obviously in any space there's going to be a lot of, uh, of margin that needs to be paid uh, because there is capital investment and risk being taken by being in the middle uh, but that can't last where, where do you guys uh, there's a lot of money being taken from a lot of different players. Do you think margin compresses where the bid and the ask is not? I mean, this is Goldman Sachs kind of spreads, right? Uh, $1, $4, $1, $5. When does that compress? Where do you think the compression happens that's going to allow publishers to get more, capture more of the value? So, I mean, I, I think that, that uh, and we talked about this on the phone, I think that, that structurally, I mean, a dollar on one side can't can't run across the Lumascape and and go into uh, to Vikram's pocket at forty cents. So I, I think that that structurally speaking, the, the way the way things are currently uh, in place with with so many intermediaries in the middle um, taking taking pieces of that money, um, I, I think that that we'll see. Um, I mean, you're seeing consolidation within specific verticals within there, um, but but I think what what you'll also see is is as the dollars get big enough, which which they are now in exchange rated media, um, I, I think you'll have to see it, players struggling to show the value that they're creating. And if they can't show that value, then the the players on both sides will go around them. Well, I, look, I think the story is definitely that the VCs are funding a lot in the middle, right? Everyone's seen Terry's slide. They can't survive on one two percent margins. In, in, if they need to deliver on the returns that their investors are looking for. So they have to try and pull, what, 15, 20, 40 percent from us, which long term is not going to work, right? So if we need a sustainable strategy for who sits in the middle and enables this technology, it's going to be a thin margin player who does this at volume and who owns a chunk of the market and allows us to take what, whether it's standardized or not, ideally some of that premium inventory and make it programmatically available to buyers that we accept as useful and good and, and strong partners. Because that's where I think it needs to go. When if you're going to be in the middle, uh, you have to, everything works in trading systems usually when it's cost plus, right? So the more cost or the more value that's known in the system, the, the less friction of the system. So if you are in the middle, if you're not providing a lot of value and they know exactly what that value is, you should be removed. I think what's the most f excitement is the ad agencies who now have very sophisticated data groups, buying groups, technologists in their companies and in their holding groups are getting much better at re reaching directly out to, to Reuters and other places. And so if there is anyone adding value in the middle, of course the system will plug in directly big publishers like Reuters and even small ones like mine can do it. So I think you always have to provide some value and that value is best done when it's around technology that's understood and helps price go up, not down. So I, I want to ask you guys. I want to ask you guys to get specific here. I think in in you know the cost of executing a trade in TV is about two percent, 
and I think two, two, three, four percent is generally what you see in other industries. Three years from now, what do you think the spread is between the bid and the ask? It looks like ad serving today. Do we argue over double click, over OAS, over other systems? No, yeah. I argue about that every day. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh. defi it's definitely a lot lower than it is today. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. Oh, so guys, guys, yeah. Give me some numbers, guys. Is it 2%? Is it 10%? Is it is it what do you think that... What do you think is an appropriate amount of value capture for people that are providing technologies to facilitate the trade between the advertiser and the publisher? That's a tough question. Your, 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 your VCs are not watching. No. Well, well, Mine well, are, look. definitely. And the cursing hasn't helped. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough call. I, th I think if, if the money starts to come into the exchange ecosystem and it really starts to accelerate 10, 20 times more than it is right now, you're going to see people like Vikram partner with other uh, pub publishers, maybe myself and others, and we're going to come together and we're going to say, why don't we just go buy a technology, make it a joint venture, make it a nonprofit, and we'll be our own exchange, right? And then that margin just becomes an operating cost of, of doing business. That's a very, very real scenario in the future um, because of how easy the technology is. You know, I, I agree with... Uh, what they said about the, the, the ad serving fee, because the exchange, the actual exchange tag, it's becoming a commodity. The value that happens is either above it or, or on the left or on the right of it for the buyer or the seller with the analytics and the insight of how do we transact in a transparent fashion. And that could come through, come through data. And one thing on, your, on your, the, the remnant side that you, that you were talking about before, the reason that I think everything's happening on the remnant side is that that's where all the technology is. Right? There's not that much technology going into the, the, the premium side for leveraging data as much as it is for the, the remnant side. So you have clients that are starting to get used to their own data sets and validating, it, val validating that. I think over the next couple of years, what you're going to start to see is you're going to see you know, the AT&Ts of the world go to the Vikrams and myself and say, here are my 20 million customers. I want to know everything that you know about them. Let's sync up. And that's going to be the connection. And that's going to be a premium conversation. Right now, that's done through the Remnant ads. I, I think the reason why it's happening in Remnant has a lot to do with that the business model of taking 15 to 50 percent of the trade is ones that VCs like to fund, yeah. and uh, so that's that, why that's there's also a lot of because innovation there. you know to that to that last point, it's a low volume market, right? I mean, relatively, we think the market will get a lot bigger, and therefore margins can compress. So I'll I'll actually take just a different uh, stance. Let's assume that the VCs are a little smarter than they are. So if there is, uh, let's just assume that today. So sure enough, if you have a format like video, which we talked about TV money moving over, we just had a week ago the new digital upfronts by Digitas, which I believe were a success. Sure enough, then there's a lot more money between the bid and the ask or the spread in a space like video uh, online, whether it's pre-roll or other formats. So that's where the investment goes, and that's where operative goes. That's where others are going. So I believe whether you look at standard where it is today, just banners and buttons, and you look at where it's headed on the high side, there's money to be made there. These are smart people, and they make the right investments to do that. But we talk as most about you know, remnant, which is like used carpet to me, so I don't know why I think that way. So people don't really pay more than 50 cents at Home Depot for little pieces of remnant carpet. So we do need to redefine the space as publishers, which these guys can do it better than I. You can. And we need to redefine new media, which is what we invest the most in. And I think that will help, you know, commoditize what's at the bottom and help grow the top. Because if you do want TV money, and I believe everybody in the panel does, we have to act like TV people. We have to stop wearing jeans and we have to do a lot of other stuff. But <laughs> v Vikram, what have you done? Because I, I, I think in the end, if, if you want to make programmatic direct, again, you need, to, you need to eliminate a lot of that spread. Because we talk about getting the... The, it from a dollar to a dollar fifty. Uh, if you get rid of half the spread, it goes from a dollar to two fifty. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to do this, and it requires scale. How how do publishers think about that? Because right now, what I see is that the the vendors that are out there aren't working on that model as much. And it and and you guys are right. It is a model that can succeed, but that's not what's being pitched out there. So we have a chicken and egg problem. How do we get premium in? Being that being that you're going to basically get robbed uh, relative to premium um, with the promise, oh, if it gets big enough, I'll cut the margins down later. I promise. 
No, it, I mean, it's hard. There's no two ways about it. I think part of, part of the problem is being resolved for us by consolidation, right? There's just too many players in kind of the SSP space trying to figure out the same problem. So hopefully there'll be some cut down there. But what happens after that when you have a semi-monopoly? Um, we are doing things slightly different. Part of, our, part of the way we're dealing with the RTB platforms is we're using it as a lead gen mechanism for our direct sales piece, right? It, it indicates a lot of interest for us. We don't necessarily have to open up to everyone bidding, but it, it pushes us in some interesting directions. Everyone has a limited sales team and limited time in the day, so that helps us. Um, the other piece is you go out there and you start speaking to these buyers individually, right? And you cut deals. I think Jay said, you know, you can also just set a price floor. That's one way to do it for sure. Um, and I think we've got to squeeze. We're both going to have to squeeze a little bit, but it's going to be. There's a lot of pressure not to allow that to happen. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but y you know. We don't stay up at night worrying about the value capture that's happening in between. What we, what we worry about is the, the fact that we're going to get what we think our true value of our inventory is. And so we have a lot of tools to be able to do that. But to, to Vikram's point, I mean, we view RTB as a channel. We think that buyers want to transact over that channel. And we think that the premium publisher's problem and fear about this channel um, can be overcome if you actually look at it as something that you can learn from. So we, we spend a lot of time with our direct sales force, educating them on what's going on with RTB, um, what their buyers are doing in RTB, uh, looking at those patterns, those trends, and basically being able to inform the sell side and our sellers um, to, be, to be more informed in front of their clients. Joanna brought up a good point about how the buy side can do that. So you know they may know that on Wednesday there's a lot of activity around their site, and so they want to buy the MSN homepage on Wednesday. We can do that on the sell side too. We can look and see what audiences are being bought, what time of day things are being bought, and we can actually say, you know, okay, that's happening in RTB, the non-guaranteed space. How do we complement that with our sales efforts? And we're getting a lot of traction uh, in the marketplace around that, around, around effectively using RTB as a signal, as a signal to what's going on in the, in the buying universe and making our direct sales force smarter from that signal. Yeah, and Rick Song at Microsoft uses that because he thinks of what you do. Uh, is incremental and additive, not cannibalized. And that's a mature way to look at it, and we hope we can do that with the other premium publishers. Because it is incremental and additive dollars, not simply, or adds more weight to the branding campaign than it is simply just a DR campaign, to Rick at least. I, I want to give a little bit of time to, to q and I have one other elephant in the room that I want to bring up, which is the viewable impression, which I think can have a significant impact on exchanges, ad networks, and the marketplace in general. Uh, you brought up Joanna, I'm a big fan. Uh, I'll read a quote from her in a blog she did about two weeks ago about what would happen if uh, the viewable impression were to really take hold. Ad impressions will drop by 50% or more. CPMs will increase commensurately. Comscore 500 publishers will finally get the respect they deserve and recapture market share from their junkie ad network rivals. Consultants will start noticing, consumers will start noticing Dare I say, liking display ads, display will no longer be the red-headed stepchild in the shadow of direct response. That's what the world can look forward to in a, rule, in a world ruled by the viewable impression. Um, when I take a look at this, if it's, let's just assume it's 30% of the impressions with most publishers. Um, it's probably at least half of the impressions, if not 60% of the impressions that are going to ad networks or exchanges. If this takes off half or more of the inventory, disappears out of exchanges and ad networks. Well, I think it could be a very good thing for the premium or the, the, the head of the tail publishers. I think, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time with the IAB right now on this project. And, and, you know, the reality is there's a lot of RTB supply out there. It's not all good. Um, viewability of those impressions is only one problem. Context. Um, where those impressions live, the, the types of pages those impressions live. So I think it's a good initiative, and you know we, we support it. We're, we're certainly involved in a lot of deep conversations around it. I think if you believe that someone should pay money for something nobody sees, you are an asshole. <laughs> I mean, there's just there's there's no two ways to get around that. It so, is a crappy metric, and we should. We're rebuilding our site right now to be 100% viewable. It launches in October. Uh, we do believe that there is something to be said for that. And, and when people talk about sort of walking away from your TV, really, really, we're going to hold ourselves to the lowest standard possible. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And on this matter, I think the two top words that you get to hear from premium publishers are just. Two, it starts with S. It's two S's. Really, what they want 
uh, the advertiser and the publisher can do it, by the way, is single share of voice. So if you're going to compare yourself to TV, you just put one ad on a page. I think the average ads per page are, what, 14 on many of the top portals. That could be too many per page. Therefore, some may not be viewed. The second thing in the S's is not just single share of voice, which could be put in the exchange, by the way. The second thing in it is really, really important is if you have a single share of voice, then that does help with supply. And if you're putting a more limited supply on it, then you can better describe it. Yahoo themselves does a better job today describing not you can get Yahoo for pennies at the 15th click in email. Because by the way, people don't look at your, while well, you're doing email on Yahoo at the ads, but they do a better job now marketing inside of the system. And sure enough, when you put effort or time in an automated system, it gets better. So I hope that you know, that supply side does better at really marketing. And you can market inside the technology. It's not us talking. Hey, Adrian, do you think if half of the inventory disappears, do you think that uh, prices double? I mean, the price will go up, I think. But, but I think that the, the other issue from, I mean, just from the, the marketer perspective, I mean, I totally agree with Vikram. I mean, an ad not seen is, is an ad you shouldn't, shouldn't have paid for. Um, but, but it also gets back to attribution models and how, how marketers and advertisers are measuring their spend. And again, not to keep picking on the view through, but if it's a view through, then it actually doesn't necessarily matter that the ad was, was seen. But I think that's a lot of our, our folks, you know, using our, our brand optimization product, for instance, um, where they're actually measuring upper funnel metrics. Um, and we see great performance with things that are above the fold that are viewable. And we will commensurately pay more for those impressions. Uh, any questions out there? And uh, anybody is eligible for the bet? <laughs> oh, I have a fucking important question. Um, okay, so, we were just saved. Thank you, Joe. So um, I think it's really interesting that you guys took this position of race to the bottom during a week where there's this other medium that's all about racing to the top. And I just, you know, can't help but make that contrast between television, because it was already brought up by you guys. But the reason why they can do that is because they create the sense of perishability. It's an allocation marketplace. And I think Skip made some good examples of how you guys can do that. And it's through metrics and measurement. And maybe it's just a matter of putting the right stories out there. Just maybe more of a statement than a question. I, I, think, it's, I think that's a good point, Joe. I'd say another part is Let's take Microsoft, because he's on the panel. We'll just have a little bit of fun. But if you're the head salesperson for a $2 million buy with Company X in travel, and they come back to you, God forbid, I don't know if they ever do it at Microsoft, but let's assume they do, say it's not working. What's the first thing they do at Microsoft? This is in the premium side when something's not working. They give stuff away. They use a really cute name called Make Good. Now, it's in TV, but it's not usually taught of taught that it's so negative. Also, you lower the price. So the better we get in premium and the better we get in RTB, we'll just tell those stories and tell those case studies. Because instead of sometimes lowering the price, you could talk about more about performance or measuring performance a little bit better when it's DR versus branding. Because the fun thing about being here in the panel, Joe, that you pointed out, this is the first time ever brand spend will surpass DR. So we're going to have to get it anyhow if we want TV money. And these guys will be the first ones to grab those dollars, and even little companies like Martini. A good question. Hi, I'm uh, Karina, 33 Cross. I would have cursed uh, if we were in France, but I'm uh, not sure the uh, US public will uh, allow me to do so. I just had a quick question. The, um, every time we talk about RTB and, and premium inventory, there's one big buzzword that comes to mind, and that's private exchange. And when you start digging into what private exchange is, you might realize that it's actually leveraging the inefficiencies of RTB today. So I'm very curious to know what's your perspective on the uh, future of private exchanges to, um, for accessing pri um, premium inventory? Yeah, I mean, I, I call bullshit on the word private exchange. Agreed. You got one. You got one. Um, I own one and have one. Disagree. <laughs> our, our well, it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. I think, you know, for us, operating a marketplace and a single auction makes, makes sense. Um, when you start bringing in, I mean, this idea of, pri I guess, private exchange or private marketplaces, you're limiting the buyers 
or you're dictating price to certain buyers, it's no longer an auction. And right. so private exchange itself is an oxymoron. It doesn't, the, the two words shouldn't go together. I, I, think, I think instead of private, we should use transparent, because that's why we kind of jumped into our private exchange was that, you know, it used to be for the local news industry, we would have, you know, 70 million ad networks filling in a lot of demand. And when that black box started to break down and we could see who was coming in from where and what prices they were saying, our exchange really, the, you know, in addition to the, the CPMs going up from what was traditionally um, the unsold market, um, the, the value that we got from the transparency in terms of going back to our direct sales force was remarkable. And one of the things that if you're going to get into this game, I would, I would recommend is that you have to have an operational structure that sits between your direct sales and your exchange sales because you're basically just selling different things to different people. Where a lot of publishers make the mistake is they put the, the private exchange or the exchange just in operations and operations is not talking to the sales people. Here's my question. If you want to sell a Picasso, do you go to eBay? And the answer is fuck no, right? You go to Sotheby's or you go to Christie's where a whole bunch of people who can actually afford a Picasso are going to come in and outbid each other. So that's my closest analogy is we sell Picassos. Right? Or we want to be in the business, we certainly sell content Picassos. We want to be in the business of selling advertising Picassos as well. That's the way we should be if we really want to value ourselves as premium publishers and not just road generators of crappy cat videos. Guys, question from the rear? Uh, Don Scott with Media General. I, you know, I like what I'm hearing, the back and forth here. I think it's very good. Uh, the viewable impression, the in view impression, I think it's a, it's a laudable goal. Is it, is it an ideal? I mean, we're, we're talking about trying to make a market correction that goes up. Market corrections that go down, those are easy. You know, the floor goes out and everything collapses to the bottom. We're talking about trying to get things up again. Are we willing as publishers to wait that six, 12, 24 months before the buy side finally catches on? Or is it that dramatic? I don't have the answer to that, but what I will say, um, if you guys have spent any time with the AppNexus folks, they, they would probably classify something like this as a prisoner's dilemma because it doesn't yeah. make sense for one publisher to take a stance or do it. They're going to get punished unless everyone bands together. So that's why I think it's important that an organization like the IAB leads the charge on, on it. Hi, I'm Kelly Kalachi from Google. Um, I'd be curious to see what you guys think about these behavioral targeting data providers that your publishers let pixel their site. Um, because the way we see it, you know, we probably pay maybe $1.50, $2 for your media, and then we pay $2.50 for their data or your data somewhere else. So how do I pay you the $2.50 for your media and then find better ways to partner with you to find your users elsewhere? Call us. I mean, I really don't think it's that hard. I think most premium publishers are putting together a DMP stack. We certainly are. We're mining a lot of our own data. Uh, and we're planning to make that available to buyers who want to buy it. I did work at BlueKai for two and a half years, so I've seen both sides of this coin. Um, and I think the future for publishers is in really finding out what first party data works for them and then utilizing it at scale. It's tough if you don't have any, but we do. I'll try to follow Vikram's uh, Picasso analogy that definitely the most interesting, the space where you buy Picassos or the media is interesting, but the people uh, who are buying the Picassos are more interesting, which happens to be the data. So in many cases, what we try to avoid in, in this world of premium publishers is you don't want someone to rent your content and own your audience. So you need to do interesting things yourself with that data. And the only way to do that is through insights. And that's what Operative and others get to do. Therefore, when you know about the buyer of the Picasso and you have the environment that best sells them, then I think you actually are really powerful. And companies like Critio, Rocket Fuel, and others are do a good job, Google as well, of course, are taking advantage of it, and that's why they're growing at 100 million and 400 million this year, respectively. All right, guys, thank you very much. I think the winner uh, looks like it was Vikram. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, you're thank, thank you.